back, everyone. Hopefully, everyone had a great networking break. Um, to begin, I'd like to speak for a couple of minutes a little bit about OC and then provide an introduction to um, the panel and let the panelists speak a little bit about themselves and their organizations before we start um, on our topic of discussion. So for those of you that may not know, Ontario Centres of Excellence, or OC, is a not-for-profit organization funded by the Ontario government. And our mandate is to drive innovation by supporting collaborative research and development and technology development projects between industry, academia, and government. Um, what that means is that we co-invest with industry and with, with government in emerging um, and transformative technology areas such as uh, AI, 5G, and next generation networks, connected autonomous vehicles, cybersecurity, among other areas. And we're also very proud to work in close partnership with um, Sengen uh, as, and its members to help advance next generation network um, leadership in, um, in Canada. So the rapid advancement of network connected devices has very important implications for the ecosystem of wired and wireless technologies, products and services that will provide a foundation for, for um, the digital economy. Um, in my notes it says of tomorrow, but I would argue for the digital economy of, of today because this is no longer a matter of tomorrow, it is a matter of um, today. And what this will create is new demands um, on the suppliers of connectivity, the providers of devices and services, and the ability of industries to innovate in order to be able to gain a competitive advantage. For established players that are already operating in, in a capital intensive environment, the key question will center on growth and on ROI. Um, for new market entrants, uh, the the key question, the critical question, will be product market fit and quickly gaining um, market, market share. So by 2025, mobile networks will need to support up to 1,000 times more capacity, reduce latency to milliseconds, uh, reinvent the telcos for the cloud, and flatten total energy con consumption. Um, demand will be driven by hundreds of thousands of data apps sharing the same network, each with its own requirements. So every user of the network, both human and machine, because that will be the reality, and that is increasingly the reality, the users of these networks will not only be human, they will be human and uh, machine, and both of these users will expect an optimal performance and experience from the network for their personalized set of applications. Device evolution and application innovation will continue to drive exponential growth in the demand for mobile broadband um, in the next de decade. So what we can say is that the global economy is now at a pivotal moment where a key catalyst for growth will be wireless connectivity enabled by 5G deployment. The introduction of 5G technology will make possible the connection and interaction of billions of devices of almost any kind imaginable that will impact every single aspect of everyday life. Everything from VR to autonomous vehicles and, and everything that can be in, in, imagined in between. So as more devices connect to the 5G network, companies will be able to use th that data to attract more users, who then will generate more data, which will then help improve services, which will attract even more users. And so this is going to create an extraordinarily powerful economic engine for companies that are able um, to, to leverage this opportunity. With annual economic benefits related to, the, to IoT expected to reach between 4 trillion to 11 trillion by 2025, depending which report that, that you read, companies, we can all agree, cannot afford to defer their IoT investments um, until 5G, uh, 5G arrives. Um, this panel is going to look at how advancements in ICT, networking, um, are moving industries forward and what companies must do to take full advantage of the transformational potential of these technologies. So with that brief introduction, it's, it's my pleasure 
to um, hand it over to each of the panelists mm -hmm. to, to introduce themselves and br briefly describe their organization and the role that they play in this exciting connectivity space. Okay. Start with me? Yes. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Um, good afternoon, my name is Don Duvel. I am the CEO of an organization called NORCAT. Uh, we're headquartered in Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, I've been at the helm now for uh, just under seven years, and prior to that I lived in downtown Toronto, so I can appreciate some of the earlier discussions around what it means to be in a rural community with an interesting contrast to having lived in a large urban center. Uh, fundamentally, NORCAT is in the business of training and development. And a large part of our business is actually in the skilled labor training and development. Uh, we have multiple offices around the world, almost college-like campuses where we offer training and education for skilled labor industries. Obviously, given our headquarters in uh, Sudbury, Ontario, you can imagine most of our sectoral focus in that is, is in mining. But we also play a pretty significant role in kind of the hands-on skilled labor training and forestry construction, oil and gas. Um, we're also in the business of commercial real estate. We have a consultancy group that works around the world. But as it pertains to being here today, uh, NORCAT has a division, a, a regional innovation center, uh, not unlike uh, Invest Ottawa here, just a little bit smaller given the geographic region that we serve. Uh, and what's really unique uh, globally uh, about our innovation center is that we're the only one in the world that owns and operates an underground mine. But production is secondary with that asset. We have transformed that mine to do two things. One, it's an experiential hands-on mining training center. So mining companies from around the world will send individuals to our facility to learn how to use kind of the latest and greatest equipment. But probably more exciting and relevant to this discussion, we've really transformed this uh, operating mine to serve as a, a one-stop shop for all that is the future of mining technology. So we call it a bit of a living laboratory, active laboratory, where emerging technologies can come, use our facility, develop, test, install, and kind of make it like a, a, an epicenter globally where you can see these, these new technologies that are emerging, not in a tunnel, but in an operating mine environment. And when you're bringing new products to market, the most challenging customer you'll ever have is your first customer. So as it pertains to today, I, I'm looking forward to sharing some insights with you around what is happening in the global mining system uh, as it pertains to connectivity. And there's a huge array of variables that I think you'll find very interesting. So I'll leave it at that. Hello. Yes. Hi, my name is Tamar Gaesa. Um, I'm the director of uh, technology strategy at uh, TELUS. Um, it is day 31 for me, so uh, <laughs> I've already lost all my hair. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as you can tell from the picture now, I just see it. No, it's, uh, so uh, the past uh, 13 years, I was um, uh, working for an operator in the Middle East uh, out of Dubai called Do, uh, who's heading innovation. Um, and I'm back here now looking to expand uh, TELUS's role in, in IoT and uh, emerging technologies. Um, I think um, from what I've seen already and what I've heard, TELUS does not require an introduction, but I think what's interesting is our ambitions in the non-traditional telco services are, are becoming more and more a focus. Uh, specifically, my team's focus is to enable the various business units uh, and reach out directly to the end users, in some, certain cases, airports, government entities, enterprises, uh, explore with them the new emerging technologies and various use cases for them, translate technology terms, as we were saying earlier, uh, into human understandable terms and uh, with the hope that this would generate new business opportunities that we can uh, help to push throughout Canada. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Avi Peters. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Communitech, which is the Waterloo Region Technology Organization. We work with about 1,400 companies uh, in that part of southern Ontario. And we serve companies right across their life cycle. So we work with firms at their very earliest stage uh, on through uh, their scaling phase. And we work with large enterprise partners as well. Typically, our work focuses on helping those companies with one of three big challenges they all seem to have, access to talent, access to capital, access to customers and new markets. Um, Communitech is a public-private partnership 
Uh, we are uh, we are a not-for-profit in true not-for-profit fashion. I have one salary and two jobs. Um, the second <laughs> job is as managing director of something called the Canadian Digital Media Network. Uh, so, like Sengen, we're a federal center of excellence in commercialization and research. Uh, that is a fancy way of saying that we try to connect 26 of Canada's uh, leading innovation hubs together, including with our partners in Invest Ottawa and at NORCAT and in a number of other communities across the country. We're all in the same business of helping small and growing companies in the tech space try to uh, sell more product and more services in more markets. And so that's the perspective uh, I think that I'll be able to share today. Marie? Good afternoon. My name is Mari Teitelbaum. I'm a VP and the CIO at CHEO, the Children's Hospital here in Ottawa. Um, we're a little bit behind the curve as compared to everybody else, but gaining momentum quickly. So obviously technology is a key part of care delivery. Um, our priority is to care for the kids, and so that's where money goes first. So you can imagine how much is left for technology at the end of the day. Uh, but we are very fortunate that we've made great strides over the past four or five years and are now in the top 1% of digital hospitals because we have a complete uh, electronic patient record that's not only available to our pro providers but also to patients directly. So it's an exciting time because we finally have table stakes and your comment earlier about the digital frontier being now feels very real to us and we're excited to get into uh, a lot more innovative work as it relates to IoT, wearables, all sorts of things that is going to explode the amount of information available to patients and to providers and depend on all of you to make that possible. Okay, great, thank you. So to get the discussion started, our first question for the panel, panelists is, how are advancements in ICT and 5G networking moving industries across various sectors forward? So maybe Samer, we can start with you. The, um, the technology, as we were talking, I think earlier we've seen a lot of use cases being presented. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that uh, was mentioned saying that, are, you know, technology advancements pushing ICT, if we take them in various verticals, we've seen examples of agriculture, we've talked about uh, 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 smart uh, cities, but I think there are other verticals and I'm looking forward to the discussion what you know, what 5G brings in advancements. We, we as telcos always think we have the answer, but I think it's always good to listen to the end users and what their expectations are and find what the problems that they need fixing are and then work backwards and translate that into action. So let's take a vertical like uh, industrial automation. Um, if you've seen Elon Musk talk about the, the, the percentage of automated tasks in their factories and how they're moving forward, all of these devices that are talking to each other are, are connected devices. And the latency that's required for them to be able to do what they need to do is, is almost near real time in order, in order to stop and avoid any you know, uh, 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 line or manufacturing line stoppages. So, so 5G, uh, again, to translate the advantages of getting 5G, um, provides very, very uh, low latency, and, and that allows not only an industry vertical like uh, automation uh, to deliver uh, real-time connectivity and decision-making, but also that really means dollars at the end. So that's one aspect. Another aspect of uh, you know the advancements in 5G, for example, is network slicing, another very cool technology term somebody is very excited to write down, but it really means a dedicated network. Um, you could tell, you know, some of the use cases already uh, we have here using VPNs uh, address some of it, but uh, we will also explore. I mean, again, telcos will tell you, oh yes, this will bring you a lot of benefits, but what is the end use case? The end use case is to be able to slice out a specific uh, network uh, topology and give it to an end user like an airport. An airport would be able then to control the aspects of that network on their own and maximize the benefits within their uh, 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 compounds. Right now, they would probably get a, you know, a SIM card with a v VPN or an APN specific to them. But with, with the 5G, you get additional benefits and control mechanisms they didn't have before. So we can go on and on with the various use cases. I think the, 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 the transformation that we're expecting 
is not going to be sudden. There's going to be uh, you know, a smooth migration from current 4G to 4.5G to 5G, uh, which at the end is driven by end user demand, not simply by flexing our muscles as telcos and saying we have those capabilities. This is really going to be user-centric rather than network-centric. So John, maybe you can provide some examples of advancements in ICT in the, in the mining sector, because typically when, when we say mining, we don't automatically associate that with 5G in the way we would associate autonomous vehicles with 5G, for example. Yeah, and I think it's safe to say that your, your comment is probably representative of 95% of the people in the audience. You know, why is a, a mining guy up here? Well, it, you know, it's interesting. The, just for some context here, the, the mining industry, like no other time in its history, is going through what is defined as a, a technology adoption renaissance. Uh, driven in part by increased pressure from shareholders of these mining companies, competitiveness, productivity, health and safety. And with the commodity upswing that we're currently facing right now, you're seeing large sums of capital being apportioned by mining companies around the world to do stuff in tech, to drive those variables that I just mentioned. And one of the underpinning things that, that I think you'll find interesting is, I would say if you, if you look at uh, some of the productivity challenges, a lot of global mining companies are looking at creative ways to get the actual worker out from the underground environment. There's a whole series of variables, high cost labor, safety, but there's a lot of re reasons to do that. So what are they looking at right now? Well, it might surprise many of you that in the global mining industry, there's huge investments right now to have autonomous teleremote vehicles operate underground. And one of the major challenges in the underground environment is how do you maintain a connected network to control these very expensive vehicles that if they are not controlled accurately at all times with low degrees of uh, you know, uh, latency, high resiliency, it could be problematic. It could crash, it could run someone over, it could disrupt operations. So the global mining companies within the constraints or the four walls of the mine are heavily investing in different communication platforms. And I think 5G is going to play a very interesting role in what that looks like. The other part to that, if you have these individuals, uh, these uh, large-scale mines operating teleremote autonomous vehicles on a network that works consistently, the other contextual thing I think you'll find interesting is in Canada alone, the forecasted labor shortage in the mining industry over the next 10 years is somewhere between 100 to 120,000 skilled labor workers. And what you're noticing is that just paying this incoming generation more money isn't gonna drive them to work in a very remote, isolated location because those are tough jobs that not a lot of individuals wanna do. So the mining companies, aside from the productivity, health and safety, they're actually looking at now an incoming battle for talent whereby if they don't start investing in these infrastructure communication platforms to control a teleremote autonomous vehicles from the comfort of an urban center, which is happening right now in Thunder Bay, they're operating vehicles you know, 800 uh, kilometers north, sitting in a coffee shop environment operating a teleremote scoop, the workers will actually take less money because they don't have to do that job in an isolated remote community. So maintaining a connected network where the mines are in, in you know, it's too bad mines aren't in urban centers, but naturally they're not. <laughs> the mines are in very, very rural areas. So you need connectedness within the mine and you need connectedness in an urban center to a remote location. And the mining companies, again, looking at it from a productivity, shareholder value, yes, but the battle for talent now is becoming unbelievable. And you can actually pay workers less to sit in the confines of a Thunder Bay coffee shop-esque environment controlling teleremote autonomous vehicles on the ground, but getting that connected network to be resilient, to be you know, high degree of uptime is critical. So the mining companies are placing huge bets in the future of mining and that's what it will look like. So that's a very interesting challenge that we're seeing right now in the global mining industry. So, Marie, can you provide an example of adv advancements in, in networking and, and connectivity in the healthcare sector that, that you're seeing? Sure. Um, I was actually really excited about the segmented network I was hearing about. So, we have a partnership with the Kids Hospital in Toronto. Um, we share a lot of patients between SickKids and, and CHEO. We are the two of the three freestanding hospitals, and we actually share a single instance of our EMR. So, if you have a child, whether they show up at SickKids or whether they show up at CHEO, single patient record uh, shared across both. Our data center is in Toronto. The amount of money we spent to get a fully redundant network completely segmented between those two sites um, 
was remarkable. Um, and, uh, and we had to do that because we depend on our EMR. Kids don't get their medications. We don't get lab results. Everything goes down if we lose our network. And so, uh, but we were only able to implement this level of technology because we did partner with SickKids. And we were able to, as two organizations, get a whole lot more value for our dollar and implement this leading edge technology because we were able to build our own virtual network to support both hospitals, not to mention the quality of care. So if you're building a cancer protocol in Toronto, you're now getting exactly the same cancer protocol here in Ottawa. Uh, there's no more separate patient records, and even the family themselves can access those records and share them as they need to. So all of these really depend on a secure, safe, stable, always available infrastructure. And uh, we couldn't do this 10 years ago. It really is bleeding edge for healthcare to be able to trust the network, trust the system, to store all of our information down in Toronto. And in fact, fully redundant to Ottawa. So God forbid there's an earthquake or something in Toronto, uh, we can actually flip it back to Ottawa and run everything out of here as long as we still have some network down to Toronto during that, uh, during that earthquake. But it really is an exciting time. When I started this role four years ago, we didn't think it could be done. And we're incredibly proud of the fact that the, the technology has gotten to us to a place where we can. So, Avi, we've heard of very interesting and compelling examples of advancements in connectivity in the um, manufacturing sector, in, in the mining sector, in, in the health sector. From the perspective of, of Communitech that works with um, thousands of, of startups and SMEs that are developing innovative solutions, um, what does this mean for them? What opportunities does, does this present? And, and what barriers um, are there that they will need to overcome? Yeah, there's no question that all of these examples represent enormous opportunity for the companies that are building the technology products that can help enable some of these advancements. The challenge, particularly for small firms, is navigating uh, not the technology environment, but the business environment. How do I secure uh, the right connection? How do I secure the right meeting? How do I um, build a prototype or pitch a pilot project that will attract attention? Um, am I working at the same pace of business as the incumbent um, enterprise organizations in those other vertical markets? Those are all things that can pose challenges for small firms. And it, it is, um, in many ways, it's, it's not really about the technology. It's more about how can we help um, scaling firms in particular make the right connection uh, to some of the companies that Dawn is working with or that, uh, that Mari's working with. How do we help them to navigate? And part of it is uh, through enabling organizations like SendGen. Part of it is uh, through programmatic work where a small company can participate in a broader project alongside um, other larger players uh, where they can contribute something to um, uh, a pilot and then you know start to build that credibility in those relationships and it it is similar for uh, small firms in those industries themselves one of the things that um, that we saw when we were uh, working with a group of manufacturing firms uh, to build a, a strategy around advanced manufacturing and the digitization of some of those things the small manufacturing firms have that same struggle about making the right connections to technology providers understanding how to digitize some of the work that they're trying to do, um, finding uh, reassurance that that investment, which may be sizable for their organization, will actually yield a return. And so there's a, there's a real need, I think, to help small and mid-sized uh, companies, both who are um, making these technologies or contributing to this technology ecosystem and also availing themselves of it uh, to give them the kinds of uh, resources and support that will help. So, Samir, you, you provided a, um, a couple of examples of, of um, use, use cases and, and interesting um, application areas. How can connectivity be used to make the most of these vertical market opportunities, do you think? I think um, the basic premise is from most of the use cases we discussed right now is connectivity and um, the, the more you know, we, we heard earlier, and I am a bit in a disagreement with one of our panelists that was saying 10 megs were sufficient for a household. I, uh, if you look at the average um, 
uh, number of devices per household in Canada, I think we're up to 9.6 devices. And if the average consumption per device is like three to four meg, we're already much more beyond that. So um, I think that's only because uh, we're at the stage right now where there's going to be an explosion of the number of devices. And as that grows with, uh, as you mentioned, not only machine to human, but machine to machine, uh, and as JC said earlier, thousands of devices per, per user, connectivity uh, and not standard connectivity. People refer to telcos as dumb pipes. In my opinion, that's a very derogatory term. I, I feel offended when I, when I hear that. I, I built networks and they're very smart pipes and they're very <laughs> intelligent. So, so, uh, so those pipes um, have, uh, you know, not only provide negativity, but I think now we're, we're finding that we have a lot more value add to add on top of those pipes. So when we host platforms for IoT connectivity like we do, um, and we I, I make available those platforms for organizations like Sengen, for startups to be able to come on board and come up with uh, use cases that we did not think of, that's our way of contributing to making sure connectivity and IoT is available to, to everyone. Um, we also provide, for example, we recently launched uh, LTEM, which is not 5G, it is now, and it is nationally available, and you can download uh, or order your own uh, development kit online, and if you have a, an interesting use case, I can, and you can have my card after, I can give you access to the you know, technology architects in the background that make this happen for you. Um, I've seen here two or three companies that already complement the work uh, that we do, you know, whether it's service assurance with, you know, Cheetah, which I mentioned, uh, I saw earlier, uh, and our security with, with uh, some of the partners that were pitching earlier. Um, so I think we, we, we would like to ensure that there's a platform that provides not only connectivity from a consumer and enterprise and health use cases, but also uh, uh, access to platforms where innovation is uh, uh, available at, at, you know, to anyone who has an idea and they want to be able to experiment and see if they can address somebody's needs. Um, I think, forget the technology, forget 4G, 5G, you know, those speeds and those latencies and those use cases, they will come when we need them. And that's our job to ensure that we have our hands on the pulse of every customer and understand what their challenges are and build enough technologies. I think vendors always like to sell boxes, but what we would like to make, to make sure end to end is that it makes sense and makes economical sense, not only for us as a telco, but for us uh, you know, through, throughout the chain. And the last thing, and we will hopefully touch on that uh, later because I didn't see it maybe throughout, is the emphasis on what regulation uh, uh, We've heard it, and I've heard it in a negative way also saying regulation comes later, should come later. I think regulation can be uh, an incentive. It can be, can be a driving factor to push uh, innovation and uh, through connectivity through countries. And we, we'll talk about examples when we come to that question. Okay, great. Um, Marie, what about the healthcare sector from the perspective of, of, of not only being able to, to leverage um, um, increased networks, um, but and connectivity, but is there an opportunity for the healthcare sector to leverage hyper-connectivity? Absolutely. Um, there, I've got a couple of use cases I want to talk through, but I just want to lay the foundation that what we've been talking about for years is here. So the concept of telemedicine and never having to come into the hospital, things like that, that's happening every day now. So we're moving beyond that conversation, even though it hasn't proliferated everywhere yet. But there's two use cases that I find really interesting and exciting. Um, and the first speaks to your issue around uh, trained personnel and the fact that it's really, really hard to find the people you need. And so it's our sleep lab. So there's a sleep lab in CHEO. Um, if parents are worried about their kids' sleep, uh, maybe they're worried about sleep apnea or behavioral issues, we have a seven-month wait for our sleep lab. Um, it's just untenable, and it takes a lot of people to run a sleep lab. So one of the pilots we're exploring is actually videotaping your kids as they sleep at home, collecting all of the data you need, so a video of what do they look like when they're sleeping, but also the data, what is their oxygen levels while they're sleeping, what's the noise level while they're sleeping, collecting all of that when they're at home in the comfort of their own bed, sending that in to us, 
ideally using AI to not have to sit there and watch 12 hours of video, but actually highlight the five minutes that matter. And suddenly that trained personnel who were standing there all night long watching this kid sleep are now reviewing these videos and identifying the five minutes that matter, sending that on to the physician. So you can imagine how much more efficient we're going to be. We'll get that wait list down to nothing um, as soon as we get this running smoothly. Um, the second one I love is an article I read last week, which is essentially the end of the stethoscope and the beginning of the uh, in-your-pocket ultrasound machine thanks to your iPhone or cell phone. And essentially, we all have that picture in our head of, of providers, be they doctors or nurses, walking around with their stethoscope around their neck. That is ancient history. But imagine actually doing an ultrasound of the heart instead, or whatever body part um, that child or person is in to see. That's huge amounts of data. It's incredibly powerful for that provider. But at the end of the day, it's a whole lot harder to quality assure, to make sure that people are doing this correctly. Ultrasound is a whole new level of expertise. We have radiologists who have trained to do this, but now it's happening in our emergency rooms, in our clinics, on the units. And so you do need to collect all of this data, send it to the radiologist, whether it's a random sample or difficult cases, to get that second opinion. You can imagine the volumes of data when every provider in the hospital is capturing video of ultrasound uh, and needing to manage that. Again, we're going to need AI to help us go through it all. Um, but these are leaps and bounds ahead of where we used to be. And, uh, and if we can't collect that information and find tools like AI and machine learning to help us navigate it, we're going to drown. But so far, I have to tell you, the, uh, the solutions I've seen are incredibly exciting. I did want to pick up on, on Abby's point that um, I remember when I interviewed for this job almost five years ago, I, uh, I, I, I made some snide remark about pilots, that healthcare runs on pilots. Uh, and five years later, I'm, I'm eating my words. Pilots are incredibly powerful. Um, not only do they prove out the concept, but they also work out the bugs. And so you really understand, be they human issues, technical glitches, and most often workflow glitches that you need to work out in a pilot to prove the idea before it's ready for prime time. And so all of these things I'm talking about are very much in the pilot stages right now as we prove it out and address the technology, the funding, but most often the workflow to make sure we have the people needed to make sure it works well and that the quality is where it needs to be. So Don, you provided a very compelling picture of how the, the mining sector is, is embracing the opportunities provided by, by increased connectivity. Can you speak a little bit, a, a bit about what NORCAD is doing specifically to help the industry overcome some of the inherent challenges with adopting the, these types of new technologies and maybe picking up a little bit on what Marie was saying about the usefulness of demonstrations and pilots. Yeah, no, it's, 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 a, it's a great segue to your comment because that's our raison d'etre for the mine. Um, it's interesting, I, I, I have a bit of a mantra whereby I believe that the mining industry, contrary to kind of popular verbiage, the mining industry does not have an innovation problem. The mining industry has a technology adoption problem. And there's a very important difference because if you sit down and talk to executives both on the mining side as well as the companies that build technologies to support the mining, and you ask them what is prohibiting these new technologies from being adopted, the number one answer that comes back from both sides is, well, we want to see it and touch it and feel it and know that it works before we invest a lot of money to deploy this technology. And one might argue the mining industry is inherently not that, uh, not that risky. It's a very conservative industry. I would say that absolutely applies when it comes to the operational component. That all said on the geological exploration, that is a very risky. You're putting lots of money in, hoping to find an ore body. But on the operational side, they are very risk adverse because if you make mistakes, the inevitable can happen. So one of the roles that we play at NORCAT is quite exciting. As I said, I use that terminology around an active lab or a living lab whereby we have an array of early stage to multinational tech companies coming to our facility saying, we need to get in and pilot and demonstrate and test this new emerging technology if we want any hope of either making our first real sale or subsequent sales to a meaningful market size. So it's a very unique facility in that sense. And, and the one thing to keep in mind to temper all of this, it's not a tunnel. We are a low grade nickel mine. We have an offtake agreement. We sell our ore to Glencore and we make money. 
So we have a very stringent regulatory environment in the province of Ontario. And I know we'll segue to this towards the end of the panel, but you can imagine where our, our portfolio of tech companies continues to grow and evolve. And probably the fastest growing subset are tech companies actually from Ottawa and Waterloo that know nothing about mining, but think their technology can do something meaningful in that industry. And when they show up and they appreciate the regulatory environment, we have a, a lot of uh, toing and froing whereby if they have a technology that might have a, a, an issue related to health and safety, but the regulatory environment isn't keeping up with the technology, are we stifling innovation by saying, look, I'm not sure that you can actually put this in an operating mine environment. So we're in the process right now working through a lot of challenges with the regulatory environment an industry that's deploying a lot of capital to adopt and buy if they can see these technologies and ultimately make the industry more competitive and more safe. So, Avi, are small-scale testing pilots, are, are they important to small businesses and, and startups that you work with? So what, what Marie is saying and, and what Donna is saying, are you hearing that from your client companies? They're hugely important. Um, one of the things that we hear over and over from companies, the best way to support their growth is to help them secure a customer. Um, you know, different kinds of grants and other kinds of support are useful and helpful, but the best way for them to prove their product and to build their company is to secure a sale from a paying customer because it helps them prove the value of what they've been working on. And for many uh, enterprise level customers, whether um, private uh, customers or government um, agencies, the acquisition of new technology um, is, uh, it, it can be a very complex procurement um, activity. It can be very lengthy. There's a certain degree of risk associated with it. And so the, the method of try before you buy, um, piloting a small scale activity uh, that can prove out the concept, it can prove the application of that technology in uh, whatever uh, industry vertical uh, they're considering, that helps that uh, small company gain customer traction. It also helps them with real-time feedback from their customers so that they can continue to improve the product that they're developing. And it gives them not only a use case, but it gives them uh, a paying customer uh, testimonial that they can then use to parlay into the next sale that they'd like to make. Great. So why don't we switch gears on the discussion a little bit. Let's talk about what decision makers and policy makers can do not only to take full advantage of the potential of these new technologies, but can help uh, move the, the, the sector forward. So why don't we begin with Samir? Yeah, um, um, so don't quote me, but... Uh... <laughs> Um, you know, it is, um, I think, having been uh, back again to Canada's um, ecosystem, I, I noticed the, the, I would say, I don't want to say the right political term here, but uh, the, the um, very conservative regulatory uh, framework that we live in. Um, and I think, as I said, it's seen as a deterrent and people you know, want to push that company like, to you know, improve innovation and to excite it, you know, you know, let's do regulation uh, uh, towards the end. I think in, in a lot of countries internationally, regulation actually becomes a, uh, you know, a trigger for innovation. And to give an example, at least from where I was uh, living before, um, as soon as blockchain became mainstream, um, the government of Dubai uh, basically set a target for all uh, health authorities and, 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 and said, you're gonna to move to blockchain in three years. So this is your target. You know, in three years, everyone should uh, already be using blockchain as a technology. That of, of course made everybody, okay, what is blockchain and how, how, do, we, how do we get there? And just, <laughs> okay, God, please help us. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think this was one way. The other way was also, uh, you know, creating, I think, I'm not sure if it's the world's first, but a, a minister uh, for artificial intelligence um, again, uh, that person uh, is 27 years old, and and he's he's already uh, you know um, proven himself outside of, of the ministry, uh, minister of uh, uh, you know AI as somebody who's actually very innovative. But the point is, what is uh, the adoption rate of AI in the various government entities? 
uh, going to be that now there is a minister with a specific mandate. Um, so what I'm trying to apply is, and, and I mean, the UAE is not just one there, are, you know, I know Singapore is very aggressive when it comes to that. A lot of countries in Europe, including Portugal, and uh, their adoption of uh, smart cities. And uh, so globally, I think um, there is a, a trend that re regulation is uh, not a prohibitor. This is not, you know, made to slow you down. Um, I've yet to find out what's the real situation here, if, if there are regulatory authorities in, in, in attendance, I'd like to meet and discuss this, but, but I think we, we need to focus um, more on the positive side. We were discussing, Mary and I, beforehand that in Sweden, people are actually personally electing to inject themselves with chips, you know, underneath their skins because, you know, sharing their, their, their biometrics or, or using it to, you know, simple things like open doors or, you know, keep your medical records or whatever, is seen as uh, uh, as a positive thing. So, and and we still have people concerned, uh, not only in, in Canada but North America about you know data security and you know if somebody gets my medical records, I think they're going to be extremely bored to to <laughs> go through this. So so, but I think that there's lots of way to secure it. There are companies that are actually in in, in present that are working on uh, cryptology and how to make this you know secure access. We just need the regulation to match uh, the, the willingness of the country to move forward. Uh, and I think that's probably driven uh, top down, not bottom up. So I mean, I can preach here for hours, but it needs to be a sense uh, you know, of top down urgency in order to catch up to the rest of the world and probably lead them. So, so Don, what can policymakers do? Well, wearing my kind of one sector hat right now. The, the, the mining industry, more specifically in Ontario, is going through a really interesting time right now where policymakers recognize that the rate of adoption, the rate of creation of new technologies to serve the mining industry is happening at a rate much faster than current policy and regulations can keep up. So if you ask me what can they do, I think there's already a, a very well-documented effort on behalf of the policymakers in the province to listen, understand, and understand the implications it's going to have for new policies. Now, a lot of these things will take more time. Uh, case in point, there's, there's really no heavy, uh, well-articulated policy for the Ontario mining industry right now around power requirements for underground communication infrastructure. And why is that important to get clear? Well, if you have too much power, too many signals, to kind of simplify a part of the mining industry, the blasting component, there's uncertainty of whether or not, if you have too many underground signals and too much power, could you accidentally detonate some of the explosives that are housed underground? So you can appreciate the importance of policymakers to listen and understand and navigate as quickly as they can. Likewise, too, with, with biometrics. You know, you, you might be surprised to learn that there's a handful of mines in Canada that are getting close to two kilometers deep. Unbelievably hot. A lot of teleremote autonomous systems are not quite there, so you still have workers working 10, 12 hours a day in 40 to 45 Celsius, 100% humidity conditions. So you want to track biometric data as best you can. And you're not going to tether an individual, you're going to do it through a Wi-Fi or a LTE communication infrastructure. And you're going to gather a whole series of data elements on that person. And you better make sure that you're getting your correlation analysis correct, whereby if that person looks to have a slowed heart rate, are they going to faint? Or do they show up at work and are they potentially impaired? And you're going to make a lot of decisions as to, well, what is that correlation? What is that biometric data telling me? So there's a lot of policy discussions right now around what do you do with the data tracking individuals in a tough environment? How do you manage it? How do you control it? How do you ensure its privacy? And then what decisions can you make with that? So those are kind of two examples right now that policymakers in the mining industry are very well aware of. They're working very diligently to solve but you can appreciate a bit of the challenge between is it burdensome and overly conservative versus it's very important, take the time, get it right, because it will enable more things to happen. So I think this is a, the, the question of what can policy uh, makers do is an important question. So I um, would like to ask that question of all of the panelists. So we have Avi and, and Marie. So Avi, what can policy makers do? Uh, well, I think you know, Don articulated it really well. There's, there is a pace of change um, that happens not only in mining, but it is happening in, in um, a number of industries. Uh, and 
we don't know yet what the implications are of some of the technologies that we have the capacity to build. We don't know yet what you know the, the complete impact might be. But policymakers need to uh, they need to be deeply engaged with companies as they are rolling out those technologies, so that we can have uh, a, an entire discussion about implications of technology. Uh, and there are there are firms that are in the technology space that are starting to make pledges about you know the the final use of their product. So. ClearPass Robotics, uh, for example, has taken a very public pledge that it will not create killer robots. It will not have its products used for certain ends. Um, there, are, there are many examples like that. And I think the, the dialogue between um, regulators and policymakers and those who are producing the technologies is one that uh, we really need to have in all kinds of industry verticals. So health. So mine's <clears throat> much more basic, to be honest. It all comes down to privacy and security. So I'm glad your life is boring as it relates to health. But unfortunately, that's not the case for everybody. And there are a lot of people who consider their health information of the uh, highest sensitivity. And so very real uh, instance for us, we had decided to do this partnership with SickKids. We'd built the whole thing. We were really excited. And we're told by the powers that be that, no, the privacy law says you must put a wall between the CHEO data and the SickKids data, and almost like a firewall, where only when that patient has been seen at both sites can you share. Well, that took away a lot of the power of our, of our partnership. Imagine if I could compare the quality of a provider at CHEO to the quality of, of my cardiac surgeon at CHEO to the quality of a cardiac surgeon in Toronto. Suddenly, all of these added values of the partnership were being threatened by privacy laws. Um, and so I can absolutely appreciate the need for protecting patient privacy with security, uh, infrastructure, and everything like that. But this concept of a paper chart sitting in the hospital is what is dictating privacy law. And really, the law needs to evolve to understand that there are new solutions, new technologies that can keep information private without shutting it down or locking it down. And so we really need um, policymakers to help us take full advantage of technology by ensuring that privacy and security are keeping up with uh, with what what our clients expect. To be quite honest, they're shocked when they hear about this wall. They expect their data to be available. If I may add, I think um, where where regulatory or or policymakers um, are are driving the you know technology forward is when they're actually heavily involved with um, the you know, technology entities to evaluate, uh, work together early in advance. Uh, they're early adapters. Some of them have their own R&D um, you know, uh, arms that are able not only to assess, but to also experiment early. And then also um, be, let's say, uh, humble enough to go around the world and meet with other uh, entities to learn uh, what's best practice and then to implement that with their own local flavors. I think we need to do to do more of that, and, and, and I guess we're, as a telco, able to support by you know, giving access to our capabilities, and we sit on uh, you know, boards of, uh, of uh, GSM associations, and, and we mandate certain requirements based on our technology best behavior, but I think policymakers also, if, if they are engaged at early stages, are able to drive the change um, you know, from the front, not from the back. So we have about um, 12, 13 minutes left. At this point, I'd like to open up the floor for any questions. If anyone has any questions, please um, feel free to come up and ask any of the, any of the panelists. And while giving people some time just to come up to the microphones, um, maybe a question for the panel is, what is the biggest challenge today for vertical industries in Canada? Don. Boy, that's an abstract question. <laughs> the biggest problem, well, again, I, 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 I'll speak to my major. Um, and, and not to be overly redundant, but right now, the, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that the global mining industry is undergoing a, a technology adoption renaissance like at no other time. Um, they're apportioning more money than they ever have. And they're doing that for a variety of reasons to be, again, productive, competitive, and drive safety. 
That said, kind of the contrarian conundrum that they're facing, they are trying to figure out how do they spend the money on the right technologies that they have surety, that the financial health of that company, be it a startup or not, will be sustainable during the life of the deployed technology. Um, how are they sure that it will actually work? Um, how are they uh, sure that the, the team that um, builds and invests this technology won't make a pivot two or three years down the road and will not support or sustain that technology? And these are very real discussions that we have. We broker them about every two weeks with mining executives from around the world, and this is verbatim what they're saying. So in terms of our specific market and the role that we play, the, the feedback that we've been getting has been driving our investments in this unique mine site, which if anyone is interested, it's only a five and a half hour drive from Ottawa. Uh, it's a beautiful rural community. I call it the Northern Muskokas. It's wonderful. Um, <laughs> But to, to, to actually bear witness to, to a mining executive walking the hallways, if I call it that, of our mine, looking at a bunch of, you know, uh, an Nokia system, a Redline system, a Cisco system, and then seeing a use case of a teleremote vehicle, the, the psyche that they can try before you buy, which is almost a, a tagline that we have within our facility, we think is going to be a huge, uh, hugely important thing to continue to drive mining companies to actually deploy their capital in solutions that will work. And that's where we're making our investments in our industry. And, and the, the interesting thing is, I think, to, to, to Abby's point, I think she's absolutely correct. We're proving it in the mining industry, but I think it's safe to say that you can apply it to any other industry. The idea to pilot, to test, to try before you buy, see it, have surety that the company will be there is critically important, and we're starting to prove that thesis at our facility. So, so maybe I'll rephrase the question in a, in a little in a less abstract way, what are some of the, the, the major barriers to leveraging connectivity for um, either across verticals or for um, companies that are looking to develop solutions um, for specific verticals? Abby? So um, if I can go back to my uh, manufacturing example for a moment, you know, one of the groups that um, that we came to know as we were building out an advanced manufacturing uh, consortium is a group called the Blue Water Wood Alliance. Um, they are an industry organization that represent uh, custom uh, wood working, uh, wood, wood products manufacturers. Um, it's a very analog business. They have several thousand members and these are all small firms, small manufacturing firms doing highly customized work. They're very, very eager to understand how digital technologies can be applied in their business to help them be more productive, more efficient, to uh, understand how they can deliver um, greater volume of products to their customers. They don't know where to begin. And so part of the challenge is the connectivity between manufacturing firms, small manufacturing firms like the Blue Water uh, members and um, other um, technology providers, whether they're focused on uh, shop floor uh, environments, whether they're focused on uh, robotics, whether they're focused on data management, data security to help these companies as they apply technology in their business. It's the, it's the human factor. It's the connectivity between people running different kinds of businesses that seems to still be a major barrier. Great, thank, thank you. So to maybe finish up um, the, the, the discussion, from each of the panelists, what is the one thing that we have to get right? Oh, there's a we, question, we, oh, sorry, we, we I'm blinded. We have to take his question. Oh, the one thing and it's also, right. oh no. <laughs> it's my conference, I get yeah, that. Yeah, oh, good. <laughs> my conference and I can question if I want. So, go ahead, um, sorry I didn't see you. So both, uh, I think Mary and Don mentioned the, uh, the talent challenge. Uh, this morning I said 60% of ICT workers work outside the ICT or, uh, or sector. Um, so what are you guys doing to address that and what would you like to see more done from the, the community at large to address the talent problem? Would you, I, would you like I'll, to I'll, I'll jump in. I have an um, so CHEO does benefit from uh, some brand name recognition. So actually on the technology side of the house, we end up with some really good people who are looking to combine their experience with technology and meaningful work. So we're very fortunate on that front. Um, but where we are struggling is actually in the clinical 
realm. We're being asked to do more and more with less and less money and have to be ever more efficient with our clinicians, be they doctors, nurses, RTs, PTs, everyone like that. Um, and so that's where our technology investments, hopefully, not all the time, but hopefully will help make people more efficient because we're not going to be able to hire more people. It's just not our reality. Every year as an organization, we're stagnant or getting smaller because our budgets are shrinking. We're publicly funded. And so it's our responsibility to make sure that, uh, that everyone that works at GEO is absolutely at the top of their game and as efficient as they can be. So really that's how we're addressing it is we're trying to make the people around us more efficient. But from an ICT perspective, we're very fortunate. So it's, uh, it, it, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, our core mandate at our organization is we're in the business of training and development. Um, and it could be on the skilled labor side or we train companies to you know, help sell their product. The, the feedback that we've been getting from the, the global mining companies because of the technology adoption, the skill sets and the competencies that they need in their new workforce are vastly different than they are today. And they're struggling with that. And if you ask them, you know, what are the kind of the key characteristics they're looking for, uh, they'll give you a long laundry list of things that nobody on their current staff really has, especially at the, at the actual you know, skilled labor worker working underground. So what are we doing about that? Well, this is kind of the unique convergence of, of two of our divisions whereby we historically have offered training and development programs at our mine using the, the very mechanical equipment, training the worker. You can envision doing a very physically laborious job. But now we're getting requests to, can you create a short five-day, we're thinking of the NORCAT Academy type program, not unlike the SunGen Academy, I could imagine, you know, a five-day course in underground communications. And we're doing it for two reasons. One, we want to build competency either in new workers or existing workers to understand how the technology infrastructure works. And it's not just LTE and 5G. It's, uh, it's Wi-Fi systems. It's LoRa. It's MyOD. It's a whole array of them. And there's a competency element directly applied to the actual workforce at that mine, so a bit customized. But the other element that's equally as important that was surprising to me it's can you create confidence in the existing workforce that they could actually address some of these issues? Because in a heavily unionized environment, at least in the province of Ontario, but other jurisdictions that may not be unionized, the implementation of these two technologies, when something goes wrong, no one wants to touch it because it's intimidating and they don't get it and they don't have the confidence. So we're getting requests to build kind of, again, I'm envisioning academy-esque programs, three to five days, on emerging technologies, fully appreciating that your desired outcomes are competency and confidence, and that every year that program will look fundamentally different because technology is changing so quickly, you can't make it uh, static. So we're doing that with, obviously, communications, as I mentioned. We're also doing it with electrification. Uh, we're doing that with uh, continuous drilling. We're doing it a whole array of different subjects that, because the technology adoption is happening so quickly, the skill set and competencies in the workforce are just not there yet. So we're building, a, yeah, I use the term NORCAT Academy. It's not exactly what we've branded it, but you get the idea. So any final thoughts, Avi, Samir? I think this notion of training and talent is really critical. And whether um, it's in those areas of technical competence or in the area of um, business competence for small firms trying to engage with a new type of customer in a new market. Those are the kinds of, um, of skills that we need to be building. Um, I think we are uh, very much engaged from um, what I see my team is engaged with from academia point of view. We're working with a, a few universities on uh, some use cases of, of the technology. And, um, and, and if for the universities that are here that are not engaged in the discussions, you know, come up and we'll have a discussion because I think it's important to continue to uh, increase the level of competences that we have. We already, I think, have a very good base, but I think the more uh, adoption of uh, the future use cases, the more problems we'll be able to save, uh, to fix. So um, it's a win-win for everyone. With, with that, that is all the time that we have. So please join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion this afternoon. Thank you.